Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I am here today with Michael, and we have two films on Double Feature. What are the two films, Michael? I'm doing Die Hard and Man on Wire. So uh, I'm going to tell you the theme, but you're not going to believe me. Okay. <laughs> so I guess the theme today is secret heist films that take place in famous buildings and are based on books. Great. Can we just talk about the utter failure of this pairing before we just pat ourselves on the back for the next 40 minutes about how great it is? Yeah, sure. So uh, the Man on Wire stuff, we can put that aside because Man on Wire, you can just put it with anything in great film. Uh, Die Hard, also a great film, would have gone, I don't know if it would have gone better with this other film, but uh, we handled a film on the show a yeah. few weeks prior and the pairing just would have made so much sense. Yeah, we should have done it with P2. So here's the thing. Die Hard, obviously, you're in the building and whatever, and everybody gets that. And in P2, you're in the basement of a building. A large, but Empire State Building, yeah. right? So, I mean, another huge building. Um, but also, it's Christmas. Yep. It just would have been so perfect. And the lobby from P2 yeah, kind of looks like the Die Hard lobby. So maybe in your own time, you could watch Die Hard back-to-back with p2 and it'd be great and maybe you could watch taken back to back with man on wire i'm not sure that makes any sense but try that out anyways if you want you can actually listen to our shows that way do you know why you can do that uh something about chapters yes chapters that's exactly right we have chapters in the show so what you can do if you're using uh, itunes quicktime zune ipad you can go up to the chapters menu i don't think ipad has a chapters menu but you'll figure it out you can go to the chapters menu and you can skip over Die Hard and go to Man on Wire. Or you could go back, listen to the P2 show, get the chapters in that, listen to P2, and then come and listen to Die Hard. Although you should probably do Die Hard first and then P2, right? That would be the order I would do that double feature in. Yeah, probably. You start at the top, you work your way down. Is wow. that kind of what's is, going on there? That is way high concept. Would you call it top four concept? I wouldn't. See, this is why I feel like it's good that we did this <laughs> pairing and not because we would have just had a full show of Die Hard, top floor, bottom four basement jokes. We're going to spoil these movies. Man on Wire is a documentary. So not a whole, it, it doesn't uh, surprise you at the end with what happens. I mean, there's clearly a place that the cover of Man on Wire tells you how the film is going to mm -hmm. end. So that's fine. Uh, and Die Hard, everybody's seen Die Hard. I'm pretty sure this is a safe show for anybody yeah, to listen to. probably. But if you think that you could be spoiled by our conversation about Die Hard, we're going to tell you what happens at the end because yep. that's part of what you need to talk about. And Die Hard is where we start because the documentary just always goes second. Yep, that's how it works. So Die Hard is the sequel to the 1968 Frank Sinatra film, The Detective. You've seen The Detective, right? Nope. <laughs> you're giving me what you're giving me this scared look. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Oh my god. Well, so there was this Roderick Thorpe book, um, The Detective. And it was made into a movie starring Frank Sinatra. Weird. And then the sequel to that book, uh, Nothing Lasts Forever was made into Die Hard. Originally, they wanted to get Frank Sinatra to come back. I'm just, I'm just amazed are you at blown, this information. Are you blown away by this? This information is amazing Well, you me. don't tune into Double Nap Time feature show. What no. is the... I always forget the URL double for that. It sleepy, doesn't matter what the URL is. Double because Sleepy that, Nap Time? That, that website does not exist. But yeah, you don't tune into Double Sleepy Nap Time, so you wouldn't know this, this uh, important information. But yeah. Uh, would have been a sequel to the Frank Sinatra movie, but apparently Frank... Could you imagine Frank Sinatra in Die Hard? As John McClane? That is insane. Is that, that the... Yeah, that, that's, that's his role in The really? Detective. That is crazy. Really? Well, there were significant rewrites that made Die Hard a different kind of movie. Uh-huh. Probably the mother of all action films. I have to disagree, but I can would you? definitely... Well, it, I mean, it's newer. It's one of the newer ones. Okay, all right. Well, you're the 70s guy, right? <laughs> so, of course you're going to disagree yeah. with me. Now, I'm not saying it's bad. I don't want no, I don't no, want to take my I don't want people to take my disagreement right. as me saying But it's the, the grand bad. it's the grandchild it's the of grandchild all action of films. what I would say sure. is is the sure. father of action films. So, who directed this thing? We've actually seen him before on the show. John McTiernan, who directed the first Predator film? Yeah, just the first one. Between Die Hard and Predator, I mean, th those are the only two of his films you need to see. Mm -hmm. What Die Hard has going for it is that its beauty lies in its simplicity. I'm going to give you four points give that four I think points. make Die Hard. You got one building, one action hero, 
one driving plot and one Alan Rickman. One Hans Gruber. <laughs> I think I think those are the four things that you need. Right. And why don't we just take them in that order, right? Right. All right. Let's start with the plaza. I think, you know, I end up watching Die Hard every fucking December right around Christmas time just because that's what happens. Everybody's whipping out these top ten lists of their bullshit Christmas whatever stupid mm-hmm. movies. And every once in a while, I will catch Die Hard on someone's list and remind myself that although it's two hours long, I can afford two hours a year to watch Die Hard. But the Christmas stuff adds to the the mood. John McClane first coming off that airplane, returning to his wife, just the whole bad day movie vibe. All of that is nestled inside this beautiful Nakatomi Plaza. And this is the Fox Plaza, right? The right, building right. in one of the, what, four skyscrapers in yeah. the Los Angeles, the silly little Los Angeles skyline. At the time, the building was brand new. You know, all the damage and stuff was, I think it's just the exterior that they're using, but I could be wrong about that. But all the damage is done using these scale models. I don't think it's the same scale model that they actually have inside the film, if you can spot that. But I think the damage is pretty convincing. I think the special oh, yeah, effects are totally. pretty convincing. Especially the scene we see at the end, the spoiler scene where he falls out of the building. Mm -hmm. Although there isn't a uh, loud Foley splat sound, which I always kind of miss when that happens. You know, I'm actually glad. I was afraid that they were going to make a big, ridiculous mess of Hans Gruber. But the fact of the matter is... You see the reaction on everyone's face. That's all you need. The fact of the matter is, when you hit the ground, you don't make a splash. Right. Now, careful viewers will also note that they have seen the Fox Plaza... On our show before, when we did Fight Club, it's mm-hmm. one of the buildings at the right. end of Fight Club, yeah. and I think it shows up in a couple other movies, none of which we've ever really talked about. But I don't think anybody but myself watches this for the Fox Plaza. I think they watch it for Bruce Willis, with hair this time he around. He has hair for all three of the Die Hard movies. All three, that's very good of you. Well, okay, do we need to talk about the other Die Hard movies? I don't think movies? we're ever going to touch on it, so we might as well at least glaze okay. over them. I would have been happy going through this entire movie thinking that the only other Die Hard film was with Frank Sinatra, right. and that's it. It's just those two. Well, I think if we're going to talk John McClane, we might as well talk the John McClane story. The most John McClane you ever get really is in the first film. Yeah. In the second film, they weaken the story, and by the third film, there is no story they that really... They add a second protagonist yeah, in the third film because sure. it's so convoluted. Yeah, and then... In, in the fourth film, he's kind of he's kind of the big thug to the plot of the film yeah yeah. i don't you know the second movie is snore and the third movie picks it up but then the fourth movie drags it so far back down that i only end up ever watching the first one neither one of us are part of the apparently everyone else in the universe who thinks the fourth film is okay yeah i I just don't fan of that at all but you have all the stuff in the first one about his wife obviously you see his wife you have that relationship that kind of tension between the two of them she is almost the damsel in distress through this whole movie. Right. I mean, I think as a cop especially, and you know, as we see him do in these other movies, if he finds a terrorist plot, he is going to thwart it, whether his wife is involved or not. Sure. So it's not just this isn't just, you know, save the day for his wife kind right. of thing. It's save not a his selfish wife. thing. In the later films, they would cut back the stuff with his wife. I think they couldn't get the actress to come back. They got a divorce. She causes him to get headaches. By the fourth film, I'm pretty sure he was a random homeless person or something that they picked up off the street. I don't really know the uh, mythology of the fourth film at all or how that ties <laughs> into this. But he is one of those taken like protagonists that we you know we talked about taken with P2 that carries the film. I think there's a couple other things, I don't know, let's say the building and yeah. the other two whatever things that I mentioned that help carry the film, but he is where we get all of our um, first-hand information. Everything else we get is kind of recycled from the news reporters, from the officers talking to like outside. Al. Yeah, from the FBI poll rank. This is out of your jurisdiction, you know, people that show up. But they're all just, uh, that becomes an echo chamber. That's mm-hmm. just the facts after the matter. Stuff they got from John that they're just bouncing off of each other. We don't get anything new from there. Everything we get is following our guy who is inside. And in the beginning of the movie, that guy is just talking to himself. He has this kind of humility where he's making fun of himself and his bad day as the time is going on. You know, when he's in the vent, when he's getting cut up, when he's getting shot at, just all those I'm having a really bad day kind of lines, just talking to himself out loud like a crazy person. Right. Well, the other thing that's really interesting about John McClane in this film, and in I guess it's more interesting about Die Hard as a whole, 
we're following the inside man mm. in this film. Yeah. Where a lot of times a different film, especially nowadays, we would be following Al's character. Yeah. We would have the outside man be the lead in the film getting all this information from the inside guy, but then we wouldn't have to follow all the crazy action packed stuff that's going on inside. We can kind of push that by the wayside and I guess make it more believable. Yeah. Maybe that's supposed to be tension. You don't know what's happening inside, but I find that we're following John McClane. That's really compelling to me. I like that better. Yeah, me too. Well, I think that that's the strength of the film is that Die Hard kind of goes through the pains of how is this one guy going to survive instead of, how is this guy going to defuse a situation right. when he's disconnected from the man in the building? Well, when you think about all his interactions with the people outside, obviously he has his one friend that he's talking to. And the dynamic between them, that kind of uh, cowboy mentality, you know, they talk about the John Wayne stuff in the movie. All of that serves to inform you more about these characters and kind of gives you that uh, camaraderie there. Mm-hmm. But outside of those two, all that serves to do is tell you these people are now going to get in the way. The uh, media circus that forms outside is going to get in the way. The officers all pulling rank and the cops and the FBI and the tanks or whatever they're bringing in. That's all just going to get in John's way. No, do any of those things ever help him? Does he ever get one single piece of information from the outside? No. You know, hey, uh, there's a guy in the window up on 414. Hey, there's somebody pulling. Nobody ever says anything to him. He has to do all of this on his own, and everyone else just gets in his fucking way. The plot is another thing I like about Die Hard, especially for a two-hour-long movie. This is uh, two hours and 15 minutes or something, and it does not divert from the original plot you get a a bit of a twist on the story you find out new information which is good yeah right that keeps things fresh but you don't leave the building i mean this isn't just the same trick that p2 is using when you're staying in one parking lot right obviously you're in one building but you go all over the place you're on the roof you're on the the different levels you're crawling through the vent but the point is that the plot is these guys they're breaking in and they are your focus the entire time I mean, contrast that to something like the third Die Hard. Yeah, the third exactly. Die Hard wears me out because mm-hmm. I feel like maybe that's a testament to the film in that I feel like I'm going along with the characters so much I'm out of breath mm-hmm. when they are. But the third Die Hard, if you haven't seen it, moves them through all of these puzzles and riddles and they go from one location to the other. They have to get in a cab. They have to go really right. fast. They have to get to a water fountain. They have to go to a subway. And I'm fucking exhausted. I After two hours, I feel so spent in the first Die Hard, you know exactly where you are. You're moving around this building. You're not. I, I always feel like I'm wasting time when I'm moving around to 30 different places. Yeah. That's why I like the one place you're dealing with one set of characters. It's simple, but it's powerful. It's effective. The twist I was referring to, I think is kind of smart, actually. It's that the robbers have disguised themselves as terrorists. Right. When they right. first break in the building, you think they're just there to blow stuff up or to take hostages, um, but they're not. You know, I was reading, uh, I, I mentioned during the scene when they talk about the hostage situations on the TV, I think it's something like hostage terrorist, terrorist hostage, or something, something ridiculous like that. Yeah. Like that. Um, I was reading a book about hostage situations, and they were talking about how inside the negotiation, uh, it was called it an industry profession, I suppose. Uh-huh. Having a bunch of people trapped in a building does not always mean you have a hostage situation. What they consider a hostage situation is one where the terrorists are willing to give up hostages in order to achieve, basically, if they want tangible things. If the, you know, the dog day afternoon kind of stuff. Right. If they want sure. a plane out of there or a bus or money or people released in... Freedom Fighters released or whatever. Uh, But you also have, they were uh, comparing it to Columbine, for instance, which was not a hostage situation. It was a situation where people were inside a building. They had kids at gunpoint, but they had no intent of releasing them. Their intentions there was to kill the hostages. That makes it a completely different game for the negotiators. They were essentially talking about the different methodologies you would use in those two different situations. This is a really bizarre third kind of situation in that the hostages are almost a red herring. Yeah. They're not even something to be concerned with. They're there as a complete diversion to keep the cops out while they get their money and maybe form some kind of exit strategy. And then the fourth, let's call it the pillar of Die Hard, is an incredible villain. We have a team of villains. So before we get to the great Alan Rickman, we also have the usual cast of characters. We have the early 90s, more of a late 80s character of the hacker. Um, 
you're busting through the computers and overriding the system and fighting off the building as if mm -hmm. it's his enemy. Uh, always just a silly character. And decrypting to me. the codes. <laughs> yeah, and, right. And uploading a megabyte. Yeah, uploading a megabyte. Exactly. Um, I'm going to consider Ellis part of the uh, part of that team if too he's, because if he's, he's getting in the way. I love Ellis as um, you know a character that you can contrast to John McClane because they both. I guess they both have a very noble uh, and similar outcome in mind. They're both working to the same ends. Right. John McClane wants to get all the terrorists away from the hostages, and so does Ellis. Ellis just happens to be a giant douchebag. Right. That's one of those questions that every time I see this character in a film, I, it seems like something that in today's action movies, a character like Ellis is somebody they just throw in so that you hate them and eventually they can get shot in the face. Exactly. And so I ask myself, what purpose is this character serving? And here I think it is specifically so you realize how awesome John McClane is. Yeah. They're both trying to do the same thing. Ellis just thinks he's better at it, and he is so much worse at it, to the point that Alan Rickman is even... When Ellis is in the frame, you're rooting for Alan Rickman's character. <laughs> even though Ellis would get you to a better outcome, you still just want to see him get shot in the face, yeah, because well, he's think, just such a jerk. I think it also serves to make you realize that Hans Gruber isn't fucking around. I mean, no, as if you and not an idiot, either. As, as if you didn't already know right, when he blows right. Mr. Takagi's brain all over the fucking wall. Yeah, not fucking around. You know who's definitely not fucking around? is his long-haired high Carl. forehead psychic what is going on with these people always in the heist films what the second boss yeah the second boss we mentioned it in the dog day afternoon show it came up again in jcvd it comes up every it came up in hostage it's always the guy who shows up and he's a loose fucking cannon and he's got long hair and here he doesn't even really speak english and uh, he serves the same purpose that you, you called him the second boss, but he's the one who makes it out in the end. Right. Your cast would not be complete without this guy. But, of course, there is Alan Rickman. Yeah. There is Hans Gruber. So uh, we have a mutual friend, mm -hmm. a friend of ours named Jeremy Momenthaler. Yes. Um, something ridiculously interesting about him is that uh -oh. when he was still uh, inside of his mother... His father was dead set and completely serious, giving him the first name Hans Gruber. Oh, no, really? As, a, as born a first name? Hans Gruber Momenthaler. Oh, uh, that would have been tragic. But we have the real Hans Gruber. We have Alan Rickman's Hans Gruber. I love his dry sense of humor. I mean, anytime you see Alan Rickman anywhere, that's what you say about him, right? His dry sense of humor is superb. It is fantastic. Just in that thing you were talking about with Takagi, where he shoots him, alas... Your Mr. Takagi did not see it that way, so he won't be joining us for the rest of his life. I mean, just at the straight face he delivers it with, and then the terror that it right, creates. Right. Everyone else, no one sees how hilarious that is. They all just scream and panic because his brains are splattered all, and his chunky brains yeah. are all over the window. I don't know if the Die Hard movies ever get gorier than this. I don't think so. So I have two favorite scenes right. of Alan Rickman's. Uh, the first is his American accent. Yeah. Are you as impressed by this accent as I am? I, it's pretty it's fantastic. It's like he's a different guy. It's because he's all shaken up. His hair gets sure. shaken into his face. Right. And it immediately seems like they're using Alan Rickman as two characters right. for a second. Yeah, it's almost... You buy it. Uh, I mean, you buy it instantly. When we do the slasher stuff and you get in the early Freddy stuff or whatever, you mm -hmm. get the cameos by right. actors who would later go on to do legitimate things and... Uh, kind of become a type of character that you usually see, but they're playing something so out of type and such a cameo that it's almost like you're saying, is that really that actor? Mm -hmm. When you see Alan Rickman show up, he's pulling off this American accent so well that if you just walked in, you would say, oh, hey, Alan Rickman, I didn't know he was in this movie. Wow, what a weird little small role he has here. Right, exactly. I don't think it was in the original script. I'm pretty sure they wrote it in... After they found out that Alan Rickman could do such an awesome oh, really? American accent. So he wasn't even set to meet John McClane face to face. They stuck that whole part of the movie in just to exploit his humorous and awesome American accent. The scene plays out really well, too, because it's kind of this point where you realize although these guys are adversaries, although they are completely against one another, John McClane has never seen Hans. He knows his voice, not his American voice, right. but his low, deep, monotonous voice. And he doesn't actually know what he looks like. And that's where the light kind of goes off, where you say, oh, shouldn't he be shooting at him or whatever? Oh, no. He has no idea what this, this arch foe of his, who he even is. 
And then, of course, my other favorite Alan Rickman scene is just that surprise fall, that yeah. Hans Gruber fall. The one that is so good, they reuse it in the third mm-hmm. Die Hard when they're uh, referring back to the first one to let you know, you know, what character he yeah. is or whatever. Well, the Hans Gruber fall has that drop. Mm-hmm. That scene is is really I I wouldn't I'm pretty sure it's one of the quintessential action villain. Oh, deaths. for sure. I don't. It's think definitely it gets, the most iconic. It doesn't shot get a whole lot better than well, not only the movie, but I think in action cinema. Yeah, I don't think there's there's too much more of a defeat. Maybe Rambo three. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't, know I don't remember the that. guy who falls in the hole. Oh, okay. I think yeah. that <laughs> no, one kind of stands nothing out. On it. But it, it's guy just, who falls in the hole is not a fist pounding villain. Yeah, in the exactly. Way that, yeah. He's more of the second guy. He's yeah. more of the long haired, obnoxious. Yeah, guy. right, right. My favorite thing about that scene uh, is Alan Rickman's performance, although it's not really intentional, uh, because when he fell and they filmed the shot, it was I think it was the kind of thing where they were going to count to three and they released him on two. And I'm pretty sure it pissed Alan Rickman off I that they see let him, him go. I a very agitatable fellow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, stay out of his way, especially when he's playing a villain like this. There's one more element of this. It's not, I don't consider it a pillar of the film. It's something really weird. Uh, you notice anything strange about the music in this movie? Yeah, there's, it's Ode to Joy. Yeah, what's That's up with that? That's the music. I mean, yeah. I, I guess Ode to Joy is a pretty decent mix of non-christmas and christmas music well the it, first time i heard it i went oh they couldn't get rights to christmas music they used oh, to joy well, when we did when we did christmas on mars uh-huh. one of the only christmas songs that's in public domain is silent night right and silent night over die hard would be no. ironic <laughs> as fuck but not for two and a half hours no no definitely not how many swell parties have you been to where ode to joy is rocking over the stereo it's not enough swell parties but yet too many but then also it's used in the score, especially early in the movie. I don't know if it's used more early in the movie or if I just become immune to it by yeah. the end. Um, but very ominously, there's not even any joke about it. Seriously, you guys, ode to joy. <laughs> uh, with sleigh bells over it. Get some sleigh bells going in the score too. And then people are humming ode to joy throughout the movie. It's really a heavy theme. And then there's also some bizarre cues in there. I think there's still a piece from the second Alien movie that uh, was used as temporary score, but they never filled it in. <laughs> so it's still in the final cut of the movie. Just really weird mix of sound. Another movie you wouldn't think is based on a book. I'm not going to throw you any Frank Sinatra okay, uh, yeah, curveballs here. But the book was called To Reach the Clouds, and it told the story of Leap, the man on wire, the titular man of the film, and the guy who you want to talk about, someone who carries the film. Yeah. God, this guy is just such a performer. And he's so French. Yeah, he is. I mean, yeah. the thing that I think is so great about this film, and I mean, I know that it, it touches on it toward the end of the film, but what I love about it is that it's these French kids coming to America to do such a French thing. Yeah. And... America's arresting them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's America putting handcuffs on French yep. art. Yep. And that's what everything America does is. It's <laughs> handcuffs on French art. Yeah. You think that's it, a metaphor for the entire country? Well, no, I think that, I mean, I'm not knocking it. Right. I would, some, some French art needs damn handcuffs. <laughs> right. Right. They arrest him in France, too. You know, where yeah. he's, when he's performing in France, he I wouldn't say he gets the same treatment. What I thought was funnier is the note they hit on at the end of the movie where everyone keeps asking him why he did it. As mm-hmm. if that, that even shocked me. I don't know if, um, you know, they chalk that up to American mentality, but I was almost a little bit offended by that. Oh, yeah, me The too. question of why, I would not for a second... But all right, if you put yourself in their position, the entire media starts asking you why, you might say to yourself, stupid Americans, that's yeah. not even you know the point. They're completely missing what I did. Well, but the thing that doesn't make any sense is Americans, when an American does American art, people don't ask why. No. That's the weird thing. Think about a film, you know, mm-hmm. something as simple as a film. No, no reporters go, why'd you make that movie? No, no. So here's, you know, another weird side of that. I know you don't have any uh, tattoos. I'm pretty sure you don't have any piercings. I don't have any tattoos or piercings. So when you get a tattoo, the first question people ask you, what does it mean? Every single fucking time, no matter if you have, I have fucking numbers tattooed on my body, so maybe I'm asking for it. But you get symbols, you get a picture, people always ask you, what does it mean? As if you need a reason to have art on your body. 
And it's, you know, it's modification. I have piercings as well. Never in my life has anyone asked me what purpose my piercings serve, what utility, you know, what do I use them for? No one has asked me why. No one has asked me what the artistic message behind my fucking piercings are. But there is this odd kind of question when people approach something they don't understand, tightrope walking, for instance, where they say, why would anyone want to do that? That is so insane. And there are specific moments throughout the film where even I look at these people and say, these people are clearly insane. There is something wrong with them. To the point where they take him to a psychologist or whatever at the end right. of the film to see if he is actually insane. I use insane as hyperbole, but they think he may actually be insane. Someone who could orchestrate a plan like this, they would think he is insane. He has managed to sneak all of this equipment up there to line up, I mean, an engineering fucking genius to line up this rope, uh, just a really, really creative, and pull off this feat an incredible amount of skill, he comes back down and they're wondered if he's insane. Turns out he's just thirsty. Philippe himself is an incredible raconteur. I mean, his uh, he is so animated. His details are just astonishing. It's, you know, when you're going to be a storyteller like that, you have to do two things. You have to be a performer and a writer, and you have to do both on the spot. You know, I mean, somebody who's written their story like this obviously has some of it planned, But as you are describing the details, you have to know what your audience wants to see. That's the that's the performance kind of part of it. And then you also have to know how you're going to illuminate these descriptions you have. And I am blown away when I I think very few people can do this well. Uh, Most people who can make a living out of it because it's just one of those things. I think it might just be a natural talent. I don't even know if you I guess hard work and talent Mm -hmm. kind of kind of mix there. Right. But uh, he just describes his story so well. You know, even when they do the dramatizations in the film or when they cut to the other interviews, in the back of my head, I always kind of say, go back to Philippe. I just want to see him flail his arms around and and kind of flow in and out of the frame, out of excitement, you know, as if the camera can't contain him. And come up with really, really odd artistic excuses for everything that's going on. Right, It's great. Yeah, he's incredibly good at it. The other thing I'm struck with, and this is especially when I'm watching the interviews with the other people, is that they're aware of the consequences, but they seem to be doing their best not to think about them. Mm -hmm. You know, there there is this... um, this lingering, maybe not question, but thought throughout the entire film, what if he falls and dies? He mentions that a couple of times because he's a dramatic storyteller. Right. He needs to let people know that there's a very real possibility. He needs to fool people even because as the storyteller, as the first person narrative storyteller, they know that he lives. Right. But he needs to remind you that he could fucking die. And he is the only time that I remember, oh, yes, he could die. And every other character, they seem to say, well... We realized there were consequences. We ignored them. Well, I think that's kind of the team you need. You can't have a team of people who are who whose mindset immediately sure. goes to the worst case scenario. You need a team of people who are so far behind you mm-hmm. and so little worrying about, I guess, worrying about your well-being. They're not yeah. they're worried about what you're doing and less what could happen. And they're just, I guess, going through the pains to make sure what you want to happen is what ends up happening. Well, I think that's why you're seeing the story. I think if you had a uh, a team of people that thought about the consequences, they would not have done this. Right. And therefore, you would not be seeing. It's almost as if there were hundreds, thousands of people maybe who considered doing this and all but one of them thought about the consequences and therefore none of them did it. Here's the one team of people. This is why they're not talking about the consequences because they happen to be the one team that didn't think about the consequences and that is the very reason they made it to the top and they were able to do this. And luckily none of them were fucking injured because, you know, in most cases that probably would have been what happened as well. Mm-hmm. I do want to throw one weird thing at you and the movie is very careful never to talk about this. And it would probably be um, more tactful of us just to not talk about this. But it's something that drives me crazy every time I see this. There is this lingering feeling, um, this lingering notion, idea, I guess, of 9-11 the entire time I'm watching this film. The film does not even hint at it. They do pretty much nothing to even lure you in that direction. But for some reason, I mean, you got this as well, right? Yeah, for sure. I guess it's just the buildings and what they mean specifically to... Americans, you mm-hmm. hear, I hear World Trade Center and I think about a certain television show that we both like that I won't spoil, uh, that made fantastic use of the World Trade Center. But I also think about the attacks of September 11th. Yeah. 
And uh, I feel like the film is very, very careful in never mentioning that yeah, well, at all. And, and not only that, but they, they're also really careful in their tents mm-hmm. when they're using. They, sure, they don't. Sure. They don't use. They never say anything like when they were there yes, or right. the Twin Towers were this. Because well, that wasn't the event for them. Exactly. The event was well, Philippe. They, they, whenever, they, the only past tense they use is in describing what happened when it happened. Yeah, right. But not in describing events since then. Right. Everything is kind of geared toward what happened in 1974 and not anything that has gone on in their lives. You never find out what became of these people. Apparently, some of them don't talk anymore. Yeah. Some of them shaved their beards off. You don't know if Philippe and his then girlfriend are still together. You it sounds like they're not. You never even see the consequences of. I mean, you just see triumph. That's all yes. you ever see. Yeah, right. The stuff that makes me think about that a lot in the beginning and what kind of sets up um, the antithesis, really, of the tone of what the movie will be is you have this feeling of a heist through. I mean, they even talk about that a little bit. Uh, everybody has different names they used, heist names that they uh, they kind of, you know, the Australian or whatever, right. um, that they used to refer to one another. But Philippe loves bank heist movies and noir and robberies and, you know, those sort of crime dramas. And they talk about the element of crime mm-hmm. a lot, especially the man with the twirly yeah. uh, villain the mustache. Man. Yeah, the inside, another fucking heist name, you know what I mean? Uh, and you see them, the movie opens with them breaking into the World Trade Center. The first time I saw the movie, I've, obviously the second time I know exactly what they're doing and that's right where my mind is. And I know what the movie's about the first time, so I should think about that. But just the iconography there, I have to think about bombing. I have mm-hmm. to think about terrorism. I have to think about all of these awful fucking things they could be doing by breaking the law, even though I know that's not the intentions of right. what the people in the van are doing. I just think about a group of people breaking in. They are violating the law and they could be doing something very dangerous. And then you also see the the towers being built. And as you're seeing the towers being built, I don't know if you could recognize it. I, I certainly recognize a couple pieces of what would later become iconic for being World Trade Center wreckage. Yeah. You know, especially the the three beams, the mm-hmm. crossing, uh, you know, being lifted in and the towers being built. It's like you're seeing that that parallel of the destruction, that in reverse yeah. of all of these icons that especially in America, I'm not you know, sure if that's yeah. that's true of the rest of the world, but probably images associated with that destruction. Yeah, and they're changing that. They're making it something different. It's about the towers being built. It's almost like they're trying to reclaim the World yeah, Trade that's Center what it felt, and say... That's what it feels like. It's feeling, it feels like it's going, okay, we understand that these aren't there anymore, right. but just at least for right now, we're going to rebuild them. Yes. For this story... The World Trade Center has to be here. Right. So and they start with the footprints. They, yeah. Well, you they know, start, something that we see there now. They start from the ground up, mm-hmm. which is they start where things are now. They yeah, start exactly, in, exactly. in the present day and go back in time mm-hmm. by rebuilding the tower. Yeah. And that's where the movie starts to put me in this great mood that it really never loses mm-hmm. the entire time. No matter how much drama there is, no matter how much suspense, (laughs) it's almost the entire movie that they are under a blanket waiting for the security. They keep going back to that, you know, that kind of tension. And you worry that maybe even though you sort of know that they're going to be able to pull this off, you worry that they won't. And you worry that the dreams of these enthusiastic and happy, excitable people will be crushed. Mm -hmm. And you just wait the entire time to see what's going to happen. And what I love about this is just... The relentless enthusiasm you see from these people, it just, it makes me fucking love the French. That sounds so completely racist to just say all French people are excitable and happy. And, but you see that in French film a lot, that kind of, uh, just humanistic joy and excitement. It's so about what these people can create, what they can do, just being excited to have life and to achieve things just being in that moment and that is extremely exciting to me Mm -hmm. it's uh it's almost inspirational it kind of makes me think look here what i'm doing right now with my own life it makes it hard to sit there and watch the movie thinking you're on a couch in a dark room and these people are out doing something pretty fucking incredible but i love that i love people like that because those people they inspire me they make me feel energetic they um i think when you surround yourself with creative people like that you tend to be more creative yourself Mm -hmm. The other kind of people I like to surround myself with are people that are leagues fucking smarter than me. Yeah. And seeing Philippe talk about this area of expertise 
that I know nothing about. Right. Tightrope walking in general, I know nothing about. Mm-hmm. Engineering, I know nothing outside of the Fountainhead uh-huh. about. And, you know, that scene where he is, uh, it's one thing that he's already an animated storyteller and he's fantastic, but to see him describe with those models how they are going to rig up the rope, it's something that from an engineering standpoint, if I were to read about that, it would be the type of subject that I am just barely hanging on to. I could just barely understand what's going on. But the way he explains it is so simple. It's so pure. Here, we're moving this rope from here to here. I'm going to show you on this silly little model I built here. And then normally we would hang this beam over here, but that's clearly not going to work. So we're going to hang it over here and that's going to keep the rope steady. It makes so much sense. It shows that not only does he have all of this knowledge that I don't, but he also has knowledge enough to say, this is how I'm going to convey this to an audience that has no idea what the fuck I'm Mm -hmm. talking about. Um, It's just really impressive. It's something that very, very few people in that field can do. Uh, When I went to school for programming, that was a problem that, you know, the entire school was riddled with. How do programmers try and teach all of this crazy shit to people in a way that's inspiring? It's something you see in science and math very, very often. Um, I always think about Neil deGrasse Tyson when that kind of stuff comes up, the um, the astronomer and someone who, uh, Carl Sagan before him, who is very inspirational and can bring extremely heavy uh, concepts down to an audience at a very basic level where they can understand them, not feel talked down to, and feel inspired mm-hmm. by those things. Something that's incredibly hard to do from a man who has a skill set beyond this kind of uh, architectural knowledge, right. but he's also, I mean, think of the feat that this guy's accomplishing. He has to go up to the top of the World Trade Center. It's one thing to sneak in there, to bring all of this equipment, to do it without being caught. Then he also has to think about things like weather conditions. I mean, even on a perfect day, this would be an insane thing to deal with. But then he's got the wind stuff. I mean, it's illegal. There's there's just so much pressure on him even if this were controlled, and they go back to that a few times, Mm -hmm. even if this were something where they had planned it out and they had gotten permission, it would still be impossible. It would still be (laughs) fucking insane. But then on top of that, there's the other layers. He might get, he's going to get arrested as soon as they bank on that. They know he's going to get arrested as soon. It's almost sad if he doesn't, because that means no one saw Mm -hmm. it, you know? So he's going to get arrested when he gets down from here. He has to find other people who can go in on this, uh, as well and help him with this and who won't bail out at the last second right as always happens in the heist film and as happens here with him you know as well it's just another one of those things that reminds you how incredible the feat is but even more how incredible the people that accomplished it are and if that wasn't enough he crosses back and forth eight fucking times <laughs> what a show off right Whatever. i love that the police go up there the police by the way are so completely taken aback by this that they don't even re- they try and arrest him of course but he's taunting them he walks all the way over to him i just keep thinking to myself man i would be so relieved to be <laughs> done with this and get down yeah but of course he's not he's passionate about this so he turns right back around and walks the other way and you know the police reach out to him and he taunts them by turning well, i mean what are you gonna do right yeah i guess you could send the helicopter out to what scoop him up in yeah. a net i don't know what their plan is there But uh, he has that kind of control, even if it's just while he's on the rope. And it's really just the the cherry on top of the sundae at that point. All right. I'm out of breath. I feel inspired and sad all at the same time that these fantastic movies are over and that I'm here sitting in a chair in a studio when I should be out doing something (laughs) more amazing. Um, If you're doing something amazing, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com is where you can reach us. Send us your pictures of walking on a tightrope on the World Trade Center. Yeah, if any of you have any of those. And if you have nothing to send us, you can waste some time by going over to DoubleFeatureShow.com, poking around in there, finding some more documentaries that we've done. Uh, We've got a good handful of those. And uh, find some Killapaloozas while you're there as well. Yeah, something like that. Because you just want more action in your life. We have more movies coming up next time. What are we doing? Uh, next time we're going to do a Stephen King thing. Oh, it's time. We're going to do uh, Christine, which is the John Carpenter Stephen King joint. And then we're also going to cover Misery, which is not John Carpenter at all. All right. So before we go into this, two things. Number one, you've always been down on the Stephen King. As time goes on, are you getting less down on the Stephen King or are you still right there with the no Stephen King? I don't like Stephen King. I think that some some filmmakers can do good with Stephen right. King. I will also admit that Stephen King does some stories that don't have 
hoodoo voodoo bullshit <laughs> witchcraft deus ex right. machina shit in it all right and fortunately those are the ones we're gonna cover <laughs> all right great you know it's weird because you told me right at the beginning of the show that was one of the first things i ever learned about horror is that stephen king apparently sucks so says you and i've been very careful not to just blindly agree with you because i've never read any stephen king so for this show i decided i'm gonna read some stephen king so i'll have at least a little a fresh perspective yeah those books are all 1,500 fucking yep. pages. Every what one the of hell them. is it? Where do people find time to read this shit? They're not listening to our podcast. This is ridiculous. They're not doing our, our podcast. Yeah, maybe that's it. You know, it, it, sometimes we watch a movie by a director that I didn't know, and in preparation for the show, I will go and watch all the director's movies. And it'll be ridiculous, and it'll take, you know, a week or something, but I'll go and do it. So I said to myself, I'm going to go read all the Stephen King books, and I cracked the first one open. And you'll see if I even fucking finished it next time here on Double Feature. Great. Watch more fucking film. Bye.